welcome back viewers, this is James Comic on the bike, bringing you another episode of half Ass Productions. Today, we're going to try to go up to the Christie's showroom and see an exhibition of work by Forrest Bess. We're up here on the 20th floor, and uh, this is really an historic uh, exhibition. I've been in New York for about 30 years and uh, it's only been one or two times that they've ever had a uh, really good grouping of this work that's been visible. Now we're gonna start in here with some of the uh, early figurative work. These are from, I guess, the late 30s. Now this is titled Mexican Boy 1938. And uh, you can see how he was very much an expressionist and uh, some kind of naive. This is untitled. But you can see that he did have a feel for the, uh, the paint. This piece is titled Boxer. This is titled Greek Fisherman. 14 by 16 inches. But you can see this kind of a uh, metaphorical study here, the male versus female. This is a great piece. This is uh, maybe one of the first pieces where he starts to go into the abstraction. And I was just talking to uh, one of the uh, attendants here, and he was saying this is loaded with his uh, symbols and his, his images. Evidently he had a whole list of different forms and shapes that had these symbolic meanings for him and his uh, alchemy or whatever his theories were. This piece right here is maybe one of the most unusual things that I've ever seen by Forrest Bess. This is titled The Search. Now this is plywood, oil on plastic, glass, and wood, 1946. And, uh, geez, in certain ways, this kind of reminds me of what Irene Rice Pereira was trying to do and uh, maybe mixed in a little bit with something like a Cornell box, but uh, looks like he's got about three or four levels of glass that he's working on there to give it kind of a three-dimensional quality. It's 24 by 26 by 8 and a quarter inches. Well, now we'll move into the, probably what everybody knows more as the Forest Best paintings is untitled. And uh, I think Forest Best is really a kind of a seminal artist for a lot of young painters these days. This is also untitled, 9 and an eighth by 12 inches. And uh, I think it's because he's kind of a, uh, a lone, abstract artist. This is also untitled, 9 by 10 and 3 eighths. And if you get into his, uh, his story, you find out that he was a very uh, kind of bizarre, creative individual. Yeah, surprisingly, these two pieces have an almost uh, minimal sense about them. But I think the great thing is that um, he was able to use very simple uh, means and uh, get some very kind of interesting and innovative approaches to abstraction. It's titled Spots. And he does all this with a very kind of a simple, straightforward technique. It's untitled 1952. Seven by ten and an eighth inches. This almost makes me think of maybe a Philip Guston painting from the late 60s. Now, uh, Forrest Bess was from Texas. I think he lived in Bay City, Texas. It's called Red Rain. 
1967. And uh, he lived most of his life as a fisherman and uh, bait salesman. He spent a lot of his time out on an island, I guess, out in the Gulf of Mexico. Well, that's why he's got all these little symbols in here. Now, they have listed some of his symbols that he's developed here in the guide. So this gives you an idea if you see some of these in the paintings. This is what he was dealing with. This is a wonderful piece. It's untitled, 1952. This is an 8-inch square. And it was actually also like a very, uh, very sensitive colorist. It's titled a star. Anyway, he had a lot of uh, strange ideas about uh, being a morphodite and alchemy and a lot of kind of obscure metaphysic and occult things and I guess that uh, he derived a lot of his symbols from his studies of alchemy and things. It's untitled 1957 and uh, this was sometime in the mid-50s he uh, perform some self-surgery and uh, cut a hole in his urethra right near his scrotum. This is called Dedicated to Van Gogh. And he had the idea that that would help him somehow become a homorphodite and by being a homorphodite he would be uniting the two primal human forces and somehow he would be become a superhuman if you just look at the paintings, uh, see that he does have a real, uh, almost a natural, naive sense of uh, the materials. Oh, that magenta sun is beautiful. This is untitled. You know, I've been watching or looking at his work for years now, and um, although there is a uh, kind of a beauty and elegance to a lot of it, there's something else about it that's almost kind of disturbing, uh, almost uh, kind of brutal. This is titled Chinquapin, 1967. The other interesting thing is that uh, I think all of this is painted with palette knives. She's got very good facility. Look at those stripes. This is maybe one of the larger pieces in the show. Well. Now, as I understand it, um, most of these works were uh, inherited by a, a couple of people in Texas, and they've held them in their safe deposit boxes for the last 30 years. This is untitled. You know, on the uh, wall label at the beginning of the show, they talk about... Um, his fantastic use of different types of surfaces. And this is a great example of his use of blacks. We've got a very matte, dry black. You've got a grainy black. Some of the other pieces, you've got kind of a shiny, knifed on black. Oh, as I look closely at this, he's uh, got like a silver metallic paint uh, on those rings. Kind of makes me think of maybe an Alfred Jensen or a Helma Aufklimt. This is untitled. 
14 and a quarter by 15 and 7 eighths. It's also got that grainy black, but a very simple composition, almost childlike. Until you get up and look at it and realize it's got a little more, I don't know, anxiety. Untitled 1960. I guess he uh, was showing in New York with Betty Parsons, had several shows from, I guess, the early 50s until the mid 60s, and uh, I think it was only maybe 150 of his paintings known, and at some point he lost his, uh, his life's work during a hurricane in Texas. This is great. This is titled Mandala, 1967. And uh, here again, we get to see this kind of uh, wonderful surface that he was able to achieve with the knives. It's untitled 1967. Now, he used to say that. Uh, these paintings basically were dictated to him that he would uh, see these images on the inside of his eyelids before he went to sleep or just after waking. I think Forrest Best definitely has a, uh, a feel for his grays. And uh, this is a really good example of what I was talking about when I said there's a kind of uh, almost uh, disquieting, disturbing, kind of brutal approach to the subject. This is not sweet. It's titled Untitled the Void Number 2, 1952. And he's using a lot of bare canvas in this one. Well, I guess they've also supplemented this uh, collection of work with some pieces from museums. This is also another kind of uh, simple looking but uh, very kind of subtle and complex. He's got some things collaged in there. Oil and painted foil collage on canvas. another larger piece, untitled 1959. Now, I don't know whether he intended this crackle or whether that just uh, happened spontaneously, organically, but uh, really adds to the painting. Now I've seen this painting before, this is beautiful. It's titled The Dicks. 1946. I think in a lot of ways that, uh, although he was living out in Texas, that uh, the work did relate to and probably was comparable with some of the best of the abstract expressionists. This is, Denarius, 1954. The Penetrator. This is 1967, which I guess is about the end of his most creative period. Yeah, I think he died at a rest home from uh, skin cancer in 1977. It's punchy. This is untitled The Penetrator. And, uh, well, you could put this in a, uh, an art show out in 
Brooklyn today and people would think it was right off the easel from yesterday. Another untitled black bitch. Uh, you know, somehow he was able to come up with these uh, very strange images. And, and very rarely do I see him repeating subject matters or uh, color combinations or anything else. is untitled, very fresh. Oh, this is homage to Ryder, Albert Pinkham Ryder, 1951. I think his uh, frames that he sticks on there are kind of unusual as well. This yellow is horrible. <laughs> this is untitled. And I would assume this is probably one of the later paintings as well. See his frames got a little uh, slicker, more finished towards the end of his life. It's untitled 1968. 16 by 16 inches. Now this almost uh, verges into the realm of uh, kitsch. Although he does it with a kind of uh, naive urgency that kind of keeps it authentic. Untitled, 1959. This kind of makes me think of the whole uh, John Walker's series of the, uh, I think we titled the Alma paintings. 10 by 8 inches. It's untitled. Now this is another one of these kind of uh, deceptively simple looking pieces, but uh, that shade of gray against that uh, particular tint of yellow, it's fabulous. It's 1967. Also untitled, 1967. Yeah, that little detail of the uh, dotted line there, that's unusual. Well, we're almost done. This is untitled. We got a crab and then one of his strange symbols. This is untitled 1967. And uh, a whole bunch of uh, raw canvas in this one as well. It's got a great sense of line. Oh, that looks like brushwork. Oh, this is an odd piece. Untitled Oil on Mason Night, 19. Sunburst out of. 
Well, that's been a run through of Forest Best here at Christie's. Thanks, Kate. in and get some pictures of the forest best installation that was curated by Robert Gober for the 2012 biennial. Well, I actually came by for the Whitney biennial, but I got run out. Uh, we ran out of time for the press preview, so I'm sneaking back in here. Here's the wall legends. And this is the list of symbols that uh, forest best used in his paintings. This is maybe one of the most unusual paintings that I've seen. This was actually a commission. I guess it was maybe never delivered. And it's titled The Noble Carbuncle. And he's got all of his alchemical images in here. He's got this unicorn. And that's a lion with his feet cut off. And I don't know exactly what the significance of that is, but it is an ancient alchemical symbol. And that's also maybe one of the largest pieces I've seen by him. It's a beautiful little piece, and it's got a very uh, kind of desperate, decrepit old frame on there. And he's got his little forms on there that kind of look like uh, throwing sticks or maybe a, an Australian boomerang. Now, this is actually a piece that's owned by Andrew Masulo. He's a very lucky guy. I think this one is titled 12A. But this gives you an idea of how it kind of mixes the very formalistic uh, straight abstraction with uh, something else. That little slab of pink sliding off the side is kind of disturbing. You get to see Andrew's name on the list. This is another beautiful little piece that I've seen reproduced several times, and it makes me think of. Uh, Picasso's sculpture where he used the bicycle seat and the handlebars to create the uh, head of a bull. But again, we've got the great grays that uh, Forrest Best uses so beautifully. And those look like little little critters running across the plain back there. Now, there's no photography allowed in here, so I'm uh, doing this all on the down low. This is an interesting piece, and uh, this... Uh, central area, the gold leafed area where he's incised this grid is kind of a different approach you know and I never saw him use a lot of this gilt or this gold leaf before and there's a case here that's got uh, photographs of his self-surgery and some of his correspondence with people like um, yeah, no pictures no pictures please uh, some of the pic pictures of him and his Incision were so uh, <laughs> upsetting. Yeah, I just had to skip over them. This is another uh, interesting piece, and if we look back on some of the other things that we've seen, you know, he was actually using a lot of uh, references to landscape, and especially kind of coastal waterfront landscape. And in that way, I think he kind of relates to Albert Pinkham Ryder. This is a an interesting piece, and he's got his his. Uh, triangular symbols in there and this has got a black slat frame on there that I haven't seen in too many other pieces I wonder whether they did this after he died or whether uh, he framed this himself I think this is also a uh, an extraordinary piece now I don't know but I heard uh, rumors that uh, when Julian Schnabel was living in Texas that he actually went down and visited Forrest Bess when he was at the, the rest home towards the end of his life. And in certain ways, the kind of the colors, that sickly pink, remind me of some of the early Schnabels I remember seeing back in the late 70s, early 80s. And the cracked paint is nice. This is another interesting piece. 
And we're almost getting to a kind of a landscape sense with this. And they've got a little garland of flowers over this form. Almost looks like a little kind of head shape. Anyway, this has been James Calm sneaking into the Whitney Biennial to take a look at the installation that was curated by Robert Gober for the 2012 Whitney Biennial Forest Bess. Oh, thanks for not busting me, sir. And thank you, Kate.